Leading with Culture is brought to you by Maslow Leadership. Visit MaslowLeadership.com. Welcome to Leading with Culture. This is your host, Timothy Teriaki, founder of Maslow Leadership. In this episode, I'll be talking to Matt Burns. Matt Burns transforms organizations. As a business executive, he led a group recognized in 2018 as the Canadian HR Team of the Year in Retail and Hospitality, following up their 2017 award for the most innovative use of HR technology. Today, as the founder and CEO of Bento HR, Matt simplifies digital transformation, aligning strategy, technology, and human capital in organizations to improve performance. As a founder of the Global HR Summit, he's highlighting the potential for immersive technologies such as virtual reality to make work better for everyone. And as the host of the Thinking Inside the Box podcast, Matt interviews innovative business leaders to discuss complex issues related to work and culture. And welcome everyone to our next episode on Leading with Culture. I have Matt Burns joining me today, as you know, and I really look forward to this conversation. Matt is at the forefront of a lot of transformation in the workplace in the last couple of years. And I was lucky enough to join his podcast a couple of years ago. And now I heard, Matt, you're celebrating your 100th episode. Is that correct? 100 of anything is a milestone. And yes, pleased to be celebrating our 100th podcast episode. That's wonderful. Well, why don't we just start with, and again, our, our listeners heard about your background, who you are, but just tell us a little bit about your podcast as well as the starting point. Yeah, sure. So a bit about me, 20 years in the corporate world, 15 of those were in HR. The last five to seven as an HR executive leading large transformational projects. So think digital transformations, merger and acquisition activity, and of course, just the general run of the mill corporate restructurings. Um, about... Three and a half years ago, I left that business to launch my own Bento HR, where I essentially do the same activities that I did in the corporate world, digital transformation, M&A activity, corporate restructuring. Only I now do so under my own banner, which afforded me some greater flexibility in who I work with and what I work on, but also what I say. So the extension of that was Thinking Inside the Box podcast, which has been out for about three years now. Uh, we have a very passionate and uh, engaged audience that comes to us to learn about things like work and culture and digital transformation and the future and virtual reality, all the other fun things. So uh, it's been a really fun journey. And as we mentioned before, Tim, particularly useful during the pandemic. Exactly. I remember when I joined, we were in the middle of our research of the changing employee needs in the workplace. We were analyzing the change in leadership dynamics and it was a great conversation. I look forward to catching up on that and continuing geeking out on the transformation happening. So, um, well, <laughs> I'd like to start about discussing, talking about the big picture. And I know you, the both of us, we, we love talking about this, but 21st century is changing. And the way 20th century was different than the 19th, of course, this one is different. And it's usually easier to connect the dots looking back, right? But a lot is yeah. happening and COVID has accelerated that transformation. And there's a digital transformation, culture transformation. But tell us about what are your observations on the current that's happening? What's changing in the workplace? So let's talk about going back to go forward. And let's talk about data and science because it's very clear in terms of the picture that it paints. The workforce in terms of its number and composition is less than it was last year, which was less than it was the year before, which was less than the year that it was before that. We are undertaking one of the largest, if not the largest demographic shifts in workplace history in, by extension of the fact that the largest population base, baby boomers, are now increasingly choosing their predictable path to retirement. The majority of people, uh, I think 2019 was the first year where the, there was a significant increase in the amount of baby boomers who retired from jobs in the United States. That trend is expected to continue, and there simply aren't enough millennials and Gen Zs to fill in the gaps. So we will recognize a workforce deficit that will increasingly get larger, at least for the next 10 to 15 years. Meaning organizations already, to strip away all the other noise, are incentivized to attract the right people keep the people that they want to keep, and therefore reduce the amount of regrettable attrition in an organization. So that's just the, the broad macroeconomics before we get to any of the other stuff. Tim, I think it's just important to know that the days of being able to post a job and have a thousand qualified applicants fighting tooth and nail for that opportunity, they're done. They're over. Especially if the roles are highly scarce or require a high degree of specialization. Think doctors, nurses, full stack developers, creatives in a lot of cases. So um, I think that's a, a perfect place to start from is we are in a place where the workforce population is shrinking. Secondly, the pandemic accelerated a lot of those activities. So a lot of people that would otherwise 
have not have retired as quickly have said, you know what? I'm good. I'm out. I'm leaving my business, leaving my role. I have enough in retirement, enough in savings. I'm going to check out of this situation. Or we have people who decide to leave the workforce to pursue entrepreneurship or to go back to education, things of that nature. So the workforce participation is the lowest that's ever been as a percentage. Additionally, organizations are increasingly becoming more complex. So they're introducing technology at rates we've never seen before. And whether that is simple digital interfaces like Zoom to facilitate meetings or full-blown automation, artificial intelligence, and extended reality to take the work out of the hands of people and put it into the hands of a digital interface, all those factors are also creating a bigger gap between the available skill sets that are in the market and what skill sets are required to support it into the future. These are some big factors, smaller numbers, disparate um, amount of skill sets between what is needed and what is actually available. All those conspire to create for a very, very challenging um, time for talent leaders of all stripes and make the conversation we're going to have today around coaching particularly important because you need to be able to invest in your people to watch them grow in your organization. And they're going to necessitate a feeling of being invested in and growth to want to stay in your organization. And perhaps we can start there, Tim. That sounds great. Well, I like framing the, the competitive advantage and how it's shifting. So there's a shift from products and services being a competitive advantage towards people, culture, and technology being the new competitive advantage. If leaders can bring together the right people, the right culture, the right technology, but that's a big mindset shift. There's a leadership paradigm change that's happening. So the leadership approach is changing, right? So uh, would you like to comment a bit more on what's changing on the leadership ecosystem in your point of view? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess I'm a, I don't know that I'm that unique, but I do think that I fell into a privileged position in that coming out of high school, I went right into the workforce. So because of my personal situation, I wasn't able to accept college scholarships, so went right to work and found myself working alongside baby boomers for the first five to seven years of my career, who had very different views around how business should be conducted than me coming fresh out of high school, acquiring professional experience and looking at the world and going, I didn't used to have a cell phone. But now I have a cell phone. That's probably going to change the way we, way we do things in the world. But it's facing a lot of resistance around anything to do with digitization and data involving HR organizations and workplace culture. And I fought that good fight and still fight that good fight to a degree in talking about how there is a necessity for digital interfaces to actually increase the experience, the level of service, and the engagement of our employees which is a major paradigm shift to answer your question regarding traditional leaders that have a strong bias towards in-person interaction. These are the same leaders that are asking their employees to come back to the office in a post-COVID world, despite the fact there's very little business rationale to do so. And these are the same leaders that have had a hard time adjusting their leadership of style, practices, and approach for a world where the digital interface becomes the predominant tool. They're much more comfortable popping by your desk or holding court in, their, in the hallway or in their office and they're less comfortable in more linear forms of communication that require planning, project management, delegation, and acquire a lot more accountability on both parts in order to facilitate that. Most leaders will tell you, and I'm sure, Tim, you would agree, that it is more complex to manage a workforce that is dispersed geographically. But it's not impossible. With planning and with intention and with some strong accountabilities, these things are completely achievable. We've both been doing them for many, many years. But the shift for leaders is that they have to learn how to lead differently and therefore manage work differently. They can no longer look over somebody's shoulder and say, are you being productive or not? Instead, they have to manage towards outputs and less about inputs. It's less about, are you in the office at 7.30 and leaving at 7.30 and therefore you're committed to the company? Or is it about the quality of the output that you deliver after the time you spend undertaking the activity? So it's, like, it's a fundamental shift of how they look at the world, how they look at their roles, how they look at the people within their teams to say nothing of the day-to-day -day job responsibilities. So it's, it's a fundamental shift, Tim, which is why I think it's going to be challenging for a lot of leaders to make that transition. And I think everyone thinks that the times they're going through is the most difficult times, but having like, studying by my PhD and my work, the history of management and leadership in the last 50, 60 years and the waves, and but it, it's really hard to be a leader these days and, and a manager. And, and the first 12 months of covid there were high burnout rates on the employee side, but as soon as we moved to the second year of COVID, actually manager and leadership burnout started to increase and now it's skyrocket. And it's interesting to see some stats coming out on how managers and leaders are also less engaged and they're equally considering changing their jobs, same way employees are changing. So 
uh, there's an interesting dynamic happening and they're expected to manage strategy, culture, operations, and people. It's a really complex landscape there. So as part of your strategy work, executive coaching work, tell us a little bit more like what's showing up on the leaders, the executives agenda these days. Yeah, it's a great follow-up question because this is the group that is probably most squeezed in this new world. And we've talked a lot about the necessity to keep key people. I, I can't think in most organizations of some more key people than those conduits between functions, between departments, between the strategic and the execution level work in the organization. And there's been a big move towards flattening organizations. But Tim, I think you and I, again, would both agree that at a certain size, there does need to be some degree of hierarchy in most organizations for it to have success. Um, and the clarity of that role is particularly important. And I have a lot of empathy for mid-level managers, for you know, middle management, as it were, having been one myself for over 15 years in the corporate career, understanding that a lot of the responsibilities you're undertaken, that you're sorry, that you're required to undertake, you don't receive training or skills for. You have to develop that experience on the job, often through making mistakes, mistakes that can have significant consequences on your promotability, the opportunities that you get, your salary, et cetera. The pandemic introduced a ton more complexity to those roles, but the tools to help them develop didn't increase at a commensurate rate. If anything, it increased the gap between what is necessary to know and what is um, the skill sets of a manager. I think about things like, do most managers now feel confident in being able to have a level of emotional intelligence to assess somebody's burnout or fatigue or stress by way of a Zoom call? That's really tough to do. And as a leader, you are tasked with, in part, assuring the wellness and health and productivity of your team members. But if you're struggling to connect with people over a digital medium, you're going to have to learn how to develop that skill set, or you're going to be blind to some of the factors that could be driving lower performance, missed deadlines, or attrition on your team. That's one example, Tim, of probably a thousand that we could talk about. But what we're seeing is this growing deficit of skills that are needed from, on the part of leaders and skills that are being provided by their organization. So a large amount of our digital transformation projects now include a component of coaching and change management, whereas three years ago, they weren't. They were much more technologically focused. They were much more, hey, Matt, we're looking to do some software selections and procurement, some implementation, some integration work. We need your help with an analytics dashboard to think through data strategy. It's still those things. And it's we need your help aligning the senior leadership around the path forward because we can't agree on hybrid work. Or we need you to help think about how we cascade the implementation of this particular technology through the organization because we're concerned about regression if we don't do communication and training and support well. So there's a whole bunch of additional scope introduced in the work for myself. And I would assume that would be consistent with other third parties that are interacting with organizations. They're trying to fill that deficit but they don't have the internal infrastructure to do it on their own. They need third-party support to make that happen. Exactly. And that's a great segue. I'd like to shift gears into some examples of your lived experience and projects on transformation. But I'd like to start by framing first. I like defining this era in terms of not change management, but transformation management. If change is more incremental, stepwise, ongoing, like transformation is a big step. Uh, and I know a lot of the work you do is in like transformation management, whether that's the word it's, it's used or not. But tell us about the transformation at the workplace, which is a composite of digital and culture. So how are you working on transformation projects with organizations? So during the course of the pandemic, we held a lot of focus groups with leaders around the world. And we were looking to do so for a number of reasons, not the least of which was to help inform our product offer and going forward. We knew the world was going to change. We knew that we had insights that were anchored in past experiences, but that as the world shifted, we would need to educate ourselves because we're all kind of starting again from scratch. Tim, you know that led us to a conversation with Microsoft around a virtual reality conference. I'm sure that will come up later in the conversation. But as it pertains to this particular chat, what we learned was leaders needed to feel comfortable about the alignment throughout the organization. That was a, a clear point of reference that we heard throughout the entire focus group process. There was concerns around alignment that for whatever reason, whether it was the pandemic, whether it was the inflection points around social causes and social issues in the United States, whether it was these, this changing macroeconomic landscape, most organizations were found themselves in an inflection point and were asking, how do we go forward? And they were concerned about having alignment through the organization on their path forward. So for us, alignment looked, looked like things like 
let's sit with the senior leadership team and let's define the current state of the organization. Let's spend the time to really understand where are we. And then let's spend as much time, if not more time, establishing where we want to go as a group. And Tim, we met with teams across the industry, financial services, healthcare, manufacturing, retail, transportation. We didn't meet a single organization that when we started was fully aligned on the current state and future state. Which just makes sense. Again, when the world has changed, the rules are different. The, the, the patience or the enthusiasm, depending on your reference point, for things like hybrid work were very different. In some organizations, we had leaders who could not wait to get employees back into the office. That felt that was their competitive advantage. It felt like things like brainstorming and collaboration and team building were impacted with a more remote and dispersed hybrid way. And we had leaders on the other end of the spectrum that had the exact opposite point of view, that actually were resisting returning to the office that they either found personally or within their team significant benefits of operating in a more dispersed fashion. They were able to attract talent that was outside the local market. They were able to draw upon different kinds of ideas and better reinforce this, this traditional myth around work-life balance, which never really was true, but now actually could be accomplished if work was a bit more asynchronous and if we could be a bit more flexible about achieving outputs and not having to be chained to the same spot for nine hours in the course of a working day. So there was this real interesting conversation around that. And we found ourselves facilitating that conversation and that natural evolution of leaders and remarked when certain industries like financial services and healthcare had a harder time making that leap than other organizations like retail manufacturing that really just wanted to get with the future. They just really wanted to make the shift to automation or technology or change management, whatever it was going to be, use a combination of all three. Whereas other more traditional industries really fought the loss of identity from the old way of doing things into the new way of doing things. We spent a lot of time operating at that kind of human interface level around transformation. The tactics themselves came pretty easily. Once we established the path forward, whether it was incremental or transformative, then it was about pairing the right solution and the right approach to the problem set and ultimately the opportunity ahead of us. So in terms of the scope, I think that was a good place to kind of start the conversation. But as we went deeper into this world of discovery, we certainly found additional patterns. Thank you for listening to our podcast, Leading with Culture. I wanted to share what we do at Maslow Leadership in a minute. Many leaders are expected to manage culture, but are not equipped to lead with culture. At Maslow, we provide culture analytics, culture training, and coaching on how to lead with culture. In other words, we provide research and data-driven culture and leadership transformation. Our corporate programs include research in the design, where we measure the pre and post impact of our leadership and coaching programs. We have three pillars of our work. Number one, culture transformation. Our research on the changing employee needs in the post-COVID era created a brand new approach called culture actualization. The employee engagement measures and systems we're currently using were designed 10 to 20 years before and are not capturing the needs of this post-COVID era. Leadership development. Leading with culture and leader as a coach are our signature programs helping leaders on this next chapter. Number three, coaching. We develop large-scale corporate coaching programs and offer ICF accredited coach certifications. Reach out to us to get more information at MaslowLeadership.com. Well, I'm hearing a lot of strategy work, strategy alignment, team alignment as a starting point. And that also reminds me that the last two years has been so much firefighting that mm. leaders didn't have a time to what Stephen Covey would call sharpening the saws, right? So it's like, we need to actually just stop, talk about what we're doing, sharpen the saw and re-strategize. And, and many leaders did not have that time. In our research on what helps uh, an organization become a self-actualizing organization. And one of the factors was leadership cohesiveness. When the leaders work together, truly together, cohesively, that pulls the whole organization. But most of the leadership teams, senior leadership teams are actually not cohesive. And I'm hearing you did a lot of work there. That's great. You're highly aligned with the work we do. So tell us about the next step now that there's some alignment, leadership alignment, strategy alignment, clarity, and, and what, what happens next in terms of transformation? Yeah, it builds on a step. That was our first phase of, our, of a five-stage process that we ultimately rolled out as a result of the focus groups. The first step is what we call purpose, and it really is a strategic alignment exercise. Establishing that current state, where you're going in the future, and the path we're going to go together to get there. The next part of our five-stage approach is what we call hybrid disciplines, which is essentially architecture. Structure should follow strategy. Once the strategy has been determined and we're all pulling on the same rope, 
how are we going to structure the teams, the roles, and ultimately the work itself. And we spend a lot of time in that section because in a new world that might include hybrid, we've discussed things like the challenges of managing remote workforces. We do believe it influences things like spans of control. We do believe that some departmental alignments need to shift and greater prominence needs to be put on certain functions, things like occupational health and safety, for example, in some worlds than perhaps in a pre-COVID world. So we look at what the organization's strategic priorities are, where their biggest points of opportunity and leverage are. And then we also look at what's common sense relative to the business operations and help them inform the strategy of roles, teams, and the broader organization. From a role perspective, Tim, we look at things like how flexible is a role and how flexible can it be in a new world? So if you're an accounts payable clerk where most of your work is asynchronous, most of it's individual contributor oriented, and there isn't a lot of efficiencies to be gained by being physically in the office with other coworkers, we would assign that, for example, a greater degree of flexibility than the receptionist at the front desk of the office who has to be at the front desk at this point to undertake their activities. So we, we look at that level and then we assign that same um, qualification at the team level and then the organizational level, which helps with things like space planning, recruitment, coaching and performance management. So we, we help them structure that because that ultimately informs the next layer, which we call architecture. And Tim, these are the tools in the organization. This is the technology, this is the data, this is the, the items that individuals are using within structure to achieve their strategy which then evolves into the systems of the organization, which are SOPs, routines, and policies. And then it ultimately ended with what we call the enablers, which is ultimately things like change management, leadership, coaching, which we know actually propels the change. That the aggregate of strategy, structure, technology and tools, systems and processes ultimately live on paper or live on a computer screen unless they're brought to life by the leaders. And the five steps, creates a, a lovely acronym phase, which we've been deploying now for about two years in organizations. And it's the combination of work that I've done in 20 years in the corporate world, but also calls upon other traditional models like ProSci um, and other models that provide a degree of pragmatism around the areas of change management, which we find that clients are ultimately looking for. Hey, can you just walk us one last time on the, the acronym? Of course, yeah, phase. So phase begins with P for purpose. That's your strategic alignment. Where are we? Are we where are we going? How do we get between the two? H is your hybrid disciplines, that structure, the way you organize individuals and their roles, teams, and ultimately the organization itself to achieve the strategy. A is architecture, which for us is a synonym for technology and data. It's the tools and resources that you need to undertake the work within the strategy to achieve the, I'm sorry, within the structure to achieve the strategy. S, our fourth step is systems, which defines the SOPs, the policies, the procedures, the ways of working, which again, inform the tools and the data, which inform the structure of the people, which informs the strategy. And they're all brought to life by the fifth element, which is E for enablers, which is communications, change and leadership and coaching, which ultimately propels all those activities, brings them to life, ensures they live and sustain the ebbs and flows of a natural organization shift, and then ultimately help prepare the organization for their next transformation into the future. So if you follow that repeatable steps, one after another, P-H-A-S-E, we think it provides a really holistic way that's proven to be successful across organizations around the world. I love that. Sounds great. So uh, help me understand, how does culture relate to these five steps? And I assume they're diffused in all the different ways, but tell us a little bit more. Yeah. So we get a clear picture of the culture by way of that first step, which is why it's first phase is, again, where we are, where we're going and how to get between the two across many different lenses. So yes, it's about the business strategy. Yes, it's about the technology architecture. Yes, it's about the financial cost base or the physical human real estate resources. It's also about the culture. It's about an understanding of where you are culturally and where you need to go as an organization culturally. So as I mentioned before, Tim, one example was an organization that was struggling to define hybrid for themselves in a world post-COVID. There was nine senior executives with nine different opinions of what hybrid should look like that ran the gamut of complete autonomy, to very prescribed, structured um, autocracy in a lot of cases. And we worked with them to establish what was the business rationale for each one of their nine recommendations, and then ultimately built um, a strategy that allowed them to harmonize those to create a singular standard going forward. Yes, we put together the role designs. Yes, we helped them plan their spaces, but it was a culture conversation because it dug into what are the core values of the organization? What's the promise to our customer? What's the promise to our employees? 
And then we operationalize that through tactics. And I think a lot of organizations, Tim, skip ahead to tactics and they don't spend enough time on the alignment around values, which ultimately creates misalignment and where a lot of digital transformations aren't successful. I mean, I think the study before the pandemic, according to BCG, was that 30% of digital transformations were successful. I mean, seven of every 10 were not. And spoiler alert, the majority of those cases wasn't to do with technology. So we really need to look at culture in a more meaningful way, which is why we insist upon it, not only at the beginning, but throughout our engagements. And that's a great reminder that culture is, it's again, it's really complex, but on the other side, it's it's how we do things around here and how we get to collaborate as human beings. So, and that collaboration is actually complex, multidimensional. It's about how we we understand each other, how we communicate, how we empathize, and and so a lot of that coming in. So, I will come back. Like our last segment will be on um, suggestions to leaders, managers, HR leaders on leading with culture. But I'm just going to do this little tangent. I know one of your expertise areas is about data, bringing in HR analytics, HR KPIs, and and a lot of uh, boards and C level I talk to, like it's a big topic to acknowledge. How do we foresee? How do we proactively manage uh, HR KPIs and anal- analytics? So, what are your learnings about that in the last couple of years? Yeah, I think it's a distillation of what we've been talking about for the last fifteen years. A lot of the information that we need is available to us or can be easily procured. So, what we would do in that space, Tim, is we work with a lot of organizations that are trying to tell a better story with their data. Oh, they're trying to ask better questions. They may track things like turnover and wage cost, absenteeism, which is a lagging measure of other activities, but doesn't really tell you the strength of your culture, doesn't tell you the quality of performance or efficiency or output of your human resources department, and doesn't allow you to make decisions on where you should make investments going forward, whether it's things like a learning program for your employees or a marketing campaign for your customers or to your IT team for capital investments that will allow you to create better infrastructure. HR has always been in a tough position to justify and argue and make business cases for investment because the, the measurements that we have to do that are so much less sophisticated than our other partners across the organization. So we need to start there and ask ourselves, what questions are we trying to ask? What problems are we trying to solve? I think that's a really key piece, again, that's often missed. From there, what we look at with our data is, again, what is our current state? Where are the opportunities that currently exist in the organization to either lean into strengths or to improve opportunities? Where do we want to go as an organization? And data ultimately is the, not necessarily the roadmap, but it's the affirmation along along the roadmap that you're actually on path to achieving it. And we'll work a lot with organizations either during transformation or pre or post transformation to put in intentional measures and metrics to measure things like employee sentiment and change adoption and whether communications are are going through the organization, whether they're being roadblocked. So we assess predictors of what we believe to be change success, knowledge adoption, change adoption, communications, efficacy. And we look and provide predictors to organizations to say, hey, we need to either intervene in this, or, in this part of the organization because we're not getting the message through, or we need to congratulate this part of the organization because they're doing a really good job disseminating the message through it. And we use measures and metrics to establish a quantifiable metric for success, which ultimately allows us to create business cases around the impact of our efforts, which ultimately begins a shift in how HR metrics are viewed in the organization to where we can make business cases as compelling as our partners in merchandising and finance and IT, um, because we will have the ability to say, this is what the metrics were before our intervention. Here's the activities we took. Here are the, you know, the metrics after our intervention. And this is the business rationale. This is how it translates into bottom line results. So I think that's a really key piece that we're seeing more of, Tim. It's organizations who have the information, but they're looking for us to help them translate it to ultimately make more informed trade-off business decisions. Thank you for listening to our podcast, Leading with Culture. Many leaders are expected to manage culture, but are not equipped to lead with culture. At Maslow, we provide culture analytics, culture training, and coaching on how to lead with culture. In other words, we provide research and data-driven culture and leadership transformation. Our corporate programs include research in the design, where we measure the pre and post impact of our leadership and coaching programs. We have three pillars of our work. Number one, culture transformation. Our research on the changing employee needs in the post-COVID era created a brand new approach called culture actualization. 
The employee engagement measures and systems we're currently using were designed 10 to 20 years before and are not capturing the needs of this post-COVID era. Leadership development. Leading with culture and leader as a coach are our signature programs helping leaders on this next chapter. Number three, coaching. We develop large scale corporate coaching programs and offer ICF accredited coach certifications. Reach out to us to get more information at MaslowLeadership.com. What I'm hearing reminds me a lot about our framework about culture as well. And I think you touched on them. So in our understanding, the Maslowian school of thought, culture is lived in three ways. One is culture as a North Star. So that's that purpose and vision and alignment and the from to. The second one is actually culture as an operational fabric on how things work, how things are ran. Uh, and else you talked about that, the systems, the structures, the software and the tools. There's a third component, which is we call uh, culture as employee experience. And the exp- employee experience part is where there's less knowledge or ability to measure currently. Yes, there are engagement tools, but a lot of them are, are developed 10, 20 years ago on surveys. So our research on the culture actualization index, which, which brings some more leading analytics, research empirical driven. So I look forward to sharing that with you. As of one month from this recording state, we'll be launching our research findings in partnership with St. Mary University Halifax on a brand new index we're building for actually measuring proactively um, culture as an employee experience in the workplace. And I would love to empower like organizations like yourself to just, yeah, uh, bring that into the great practices and the work you're doing as well. It allows us to have good and meaningful conversations with decision makers in the organization. So one thing I took for granted a lot as an HR corporate executive was that I had a lot of support cross-functionally for the activities I undertook. Often my roles came with a significant strategic mandate and the CEO was personally involved in that mandate, which despite the more challenging days, as there is with any large transformational project in a large corporate environment, stakeholder relations cannot be underestimated. Despite those challenges and headwinds, we ultimately benefited from that endorsement from senior leadership. I know there are lots of HR people and other business leaders that do not have an explicit endorsement from their businesses. They may actually be in a situation where they don't have the support at all, or their support is being minimized or being taken away for a number of reasons that may or may not be appropriate. When we arm professionals of any stripe, whether it's HR, marketing, IT, with business metrics that help quantify the impact of their actions, that's an incredible gift to be able to demonstrate the efficacy of their activities and to ultimately make those business cases for future investment. Otherwise, you're always competing for scarce resources and justifying your own existence, which I don't know about you, Tim, but I'm tired of explaining to organizations the value of people. Like every organization now is a people-driven organization. We're in a knowledge-based economy. And as I mentioned, with a declining total workforce composition, we don't have the luxury anymore of treating people as disposable or interchangeable. That isn't the world we live in. It might have been 20 years ago. It has now changed. So as an organizational leader, I have a responsibility to my company to put programs in place that inspire, engage, and ultimately increase the performance and longevity of the people in that organization for their betterment and for the broader organizations. And this conversation around whether it's data or technology or transformational change, it can't be understated at a time when, as I mentioned earlier, the deficit is getting larger and organizations need more help to make this transition. Very well said. So in, when I run some executive coaching, executive team coaching practices, like one of the activities I like bringing in is drawing a line. On one side, there's people focus. On the other side, there's results focus. So discussing where would we locate this company? And then, but that's a single, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a one dimensional thinking, right? Then we, we plot some, com- the, the, the executives have their opinions, but then Moving into a two by two matrix, which we love as consultants, of course. What if we were to think about this as people focused low, medium, high, and results focused low, medium, high? Now, where do we plot the organization? And why is it either or? Why do we need to think either results focused or people? It's actually not neither, it's both and in this new realm. And that's what you're sharing as well. 100%. And it also includes technology, which again has a bit of a negative um, connotation for some individuals, believing that it's a more inhuman interface. And again, I would challenge, is that an experience that is shared by your employee population? Because the people that I talk to increasingly in millennial, Gen Z, and younger are asking, pleading, begging for greater 
um, thoughtfulness around employee user experience, less friction in their employee experience when it comes to things like booking time off or accessing their benefits or information about the organization. The, the basic tools to get their jobs done shouldn't be hard to access. And the information they need to get the jobs done shouldn't be hard to find. So when we look at organizations and this shift going forward around culture, part of it is around tooling. And part of culture now does include technology and data. Exactly. Cannot be separable. Now, in my last few questions, Matt, I would like to ask about the idea of leading with culture. That's what the podcast is about. So what would be kind of your final suggestions or reflections uh, for our listeners about what does it mean to lead with culture? What the, what can people do to lead with culture? Well, I hope that those that have listened have appreciated me trying to strike a balance between the technology and the culture part of this conversation. I think they're both interchangeable and they're complementary. I, I think at its most simple, strip away all the complexity, we need to understand where we are. We need to understand where we're going. And we need to understand the path between those two elements. A lot of organizations cannot define that for us today. So while it may sound simple, it's a very hard activity to get to a degree of alignment and understanding around that. And I do this in my organization at least once a month. And it's funny to see how people's evolutions of their thinking shifts, even within a small business like ours, to say nothing of a larger organization. I think that's a key part of it is understanding where those elements are at. The second piece is, is creating repeatable, predictable, transparent, um, ethical measures and mechanisms to solicit and to receive employee feedback. Whether that's an employee survey, whether that's town hall meetings, open houses, suggestion boxes, whatever you determine is the best interface in your company to provide and to receive employee feedback, increase the methods of that. I would encourage you to use digital interfaces to get more and more feedback and make it more asynchronous. And when you get that information, report it back to your team members, take action against the items that you can, and explain why you can and why you can't. And then repeat that. That's the strategy for every engagement plan for every company, by the way, either. But we get confused on the path to making beautiful PowerPoints and producing wonderful engagement programs. This comes down to simplicity. The, the tools that you use to deliver is where you can innovate. So as I mentioned earlier, we use tools at Bento HR like virtual reality, which provides a very compelling and innovative and immersive and intimate digital communication interface for activities that would otherwise be very linear over things like Zoom and phone calls and emails. But you don't have to use virtual reality. You can use Slack. You can use Yammer. You can use a Facebook message group. You can use any number of methods, but bring your people together, solicit their feedback, report back against it, take actions, share the wins, justify the actions you can't take. If we can start with those basic hygiene elements, Tim, and then if leaders themselves can look inwardly, deploy a lot of patience and empathy and kindness towards themselves, but then ultimately their teams, I think we have a pretty good shot. It's just, can we get out of our own way to do it? Matt, I always enjoy talking to you. I appreciate you the, the how you're purpose-driven, how passionate you are about what you do. And that's something we, we both share. So I appreciate the angles you bring on HR tech, HR innovation and HR metrics and KPIs. And, uh, I love it. And how those two uh, work well together in terms of when implementation of that is needed or behavior change is needed. Coaching is such a great way of pairing with that and, and the, the HR transformation, the technology transformation and, and, and providing leaders with that support, that safe space to reflect on how are they dealing with the change, the classical uh, emotion management of change and transformation, the, but the behavior change. So a lot of potential synergies to all of our listeners here. So I really appreciate the time where we spent together and folks are once more Matt Burns, uh, founder of Ventovox HR. And also I, I really encourage you to listen to his podcast, Thinking Inside the Box. Any last comments, Matt? Thank you so much. No, just thanks for your time today. Looking forward to seeing your success. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Matt. We'll take good care. And thank you everyone for listening to our episode. Stay tuned for our upcoming episodes and we'll see each other in the next one.